name is Kate, and I am hype to hang out with you guys tonight. And what a sweet time of worship. So thank y'all for letting me join you guys tonight in worship at what God is already doing here at Youth Conference. Like, this is so cool. There's nothing that's more joyful to me than a room full of teenagers who want to worship the Lord, who want to know more about God. And what's so cool is that the Bible tells us that when we seek God, he meets us right where we are. So just the fact that you showed up tonight means that God is going to meet you right where you are if you are listening. And that's my prayer for you and for me is that we would listen to what it is that God desires to say to us tonight. And I'm honored to be alongside of your youth pastors and your leaders here uh, this weekend. I've just heard such cool things about what God is already doing, and I'm pumped to get to be a part of it. Well, like I said earlier, my name is Kate. Uh, I am, I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, but I'm from Georgia originally, so that's where some of my southern, like I'll say like no, I got no, you know, also my southern comes out a little bit from Georgia. Uh, I think we have a picture of my family just because everybody always shows their family, so I feel like it's just uh, a thing for me, you know, to get to show you my family. Uh, Do we have a picture? Maybe? Maybe not. That's okay if not. Uh, Because here's the deal. Uh, I'm about to go see my, oh, there it is. Oh, I'm kind of covered up, but that's okay. I'm the really adorable, oh, look, look, I'm the adorable one right here. (laughs) The really tiny one, that's me. Uh, People like to show you modern day pictures of their family. I like to show you pictures of my family from the 90s. (laughs) So you see the hairdos? Okay, that was the 90s. All right, that was cool back then. I promise my mom was adorable with her little bangs. Uh, I have two older sisters. Um, They are uh, like a good amount older than me. So I like to say I was kind of like an only child, but with benefits, okay? Because I could like call my older sisters even though they didn't live at home with me. But uh, being the youngest, anybody else in here the youngest in your family? Okay, kindred spirits, all right, across the room with me here tonight, all right? If you are the youngest in the family, you are going to immediately identify with what I'm about to tell you, all right? So my sisters um, were so gracious to me, you know, just the the kindest sisters. They said, you know what, Kate, we're going to just not ever have to make you have to make a decision. We're going to make all the decisions for you, okay? Where you sit in the car, you might, you might wonder, should I sit in the front seat or the back seat or in the middle with your feet on the hump? We're going to go ahead and make that decision for you, okay? We're going to let you sit in the middle with your feet on the hump, okay? Uh, what movie we're going to watch on a Friday night? You know what? We're going to make that decision for you, okay? We'll just take that. It's so kind of them that I never had to make a decision as a child because my sisters just made those decisions for me. Uh, and one of the decisions that they would make on a, and I'm not joking with you, a daily basis, is that they would make me watch one particular movie every day. And let me tell you, this movie sort of terrified me, okay? So don't judge me. But they would make me watch The Little Mermaid every day of my life, okay? So childhood, and you're like, why does that movie terrify you? Have you watched it recently with Ursula and the like tornado of water? Okay, very terrifying to like three-year-old me, all right? But they would make me watch the movie Little Mermaid. If you haven't seen it in a while, there's a mermaid, okay? (laughs) She falls in love with a dude. She wants to like marry the dude. She makes a, you know, a deal with a witch who's also an octopus, and gets legs, but she has to sell her voice for the legs. Very fast. How do people come up with these things? I don't know. All right. She goes to land. She falls in love. All the things. There's a tornado of water. All right. And then, you know, they live happily ever after. Okay. That's the premise of The Little Mermaid, in case you haven't watched the old one or the new one recently. But there's one scene in particular in The Little Mermaid that I think about all the time. All right. And it's one where Scuttle, remember Scuttle, the little sea, you know, whatever he's called, little seagull, that's the word I was looking for, where the seagull uh, comes to to Ariel, and Ariel's found a particular thing, and she's like, Scuttle, what do I do with this thing? Anybody remember what that thing is? A fork, there you go. All right, do you remember what Scuttle called it? A dinglehopper, there you go, right? And he tells her, uh, hey, Ariel, I know what you're supposed to do with that. Uh, That is to brush your hair. And she's like, oh, what a great invention. You know, this is awesome. And I remember as a little kid, I would watch that, and I thought that was like the funniest thing on the planet. I would laugh out loud every time, and then I would cry when Ursula came on, so it was a roller coaster of emotions. Uh, but I love that scene, and I love that moment when he tells her, hey, that, that fork is actually used as a hairbrush. And then you see her a few in the palace of the, the prince, right? She has legs now. 
And she's dressed in this like beautiful gown and like there's like glitter in her hair and somehow she like knows how to walk. And she's made her way to the, the dinner table at the king's palace and she picks up the fork. What does she do with it? Brushes her hair. Cause that's the only thing she ever knew that you're supposed to do with a fork. Strange that you would have like a hair care tool at your dinner table, but that's what she knew. And I love that scene because I think so often that scene is exactly the place in life that you and I are in. Because for many of you, whether it was last night or last week or sometime in your past, you have made a decision in your life to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have made that one-time decision to surrender your life to Jesus, to say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you loved me so much that you came to earth and lived a perfect life and died on a cross for my sins, paid a a debt that I could never have earned on my own. But the the beauty of the story is that it, it doesn't stop there. Jesus, I believe that you rose from the dead three days later, defeating death and shame and fear and guilt and all the things that have held me captive. And so Jesus, I put my faith and my trust in you. And in that moment, there is something incredible that happens inside of us. We are made new. In fact, we read that in 2 Corinthians. You can turn there if you want to, it'll be on the screens. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told that this incredible being made new happens in verse 17 says this, Paul is talking to a bunch of people who have made that decision to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And Paul says this, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has come. The old life has gone and the new life has come. It's that picture of of Ariel, right? Like becoming a whole new being. She's no longer a mermaid. Now she's a human being. Not only is she a human with legs, but she's dressed in like this beautiful royal clothing. And she's been invited into the palace of the king. And she's seated at the table with the king and the prince and all of the fancy people. But she picks up the fork and starts to brush her hair with it because it's the only thing she's ever known. And many of you have made the decision to give your life to Christ. You have been made new. You have been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have been clothed in his righteousness. You have been adopted into the family of God. You have been seated at the table with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And yet you're still using the fork to brush your hair. You're still using old life practices in your new life. You're still trying to use old habits to live in your new life. And here's what I want you to know, students, is that God has not only called you into a new life, into a a, a new being in a relationship with him, but he has called you to live out a whole new purpose. In fact, in a relationship with Jesus, we are given the very purpose for which we were created. But we got to stop using old habits in our new life. We've got to stop picking up the fork and thinking we should brush our hair with it. We've got to start learning what it looks like to walk in a relationship with Jesus Christ. To learn what it looks like to walk as a new creation. So tonight, we're going to talk about the very purpose that you were created for, the very purpose that you gain when you trust Jesus as your Savior. We read what that purpose is as we continue to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, says this, and all of this, us being new creations in Christ Jesus, All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task or this purpose, this job of reconciling people to him. The word reconcile, that's a big word, especially for the summertime, all right? Reconcile just means to take something that was broken and to make it whole again, So here he says uh, that he's given us this task of reconciling people to him. Verse 19, 
for God was in Christ or through Christ Jesus, reconciling, taking what was broken in the world and making it whole again, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them, meaning he forgives sin past, present, and future. And lastly, he says this, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation that God has given you and I this message of how he sent his son to take what was broken in the world and make it whole again. He has given you and I this message, this purpose. It goes on in the next verse to say this in verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. As we speak for Christ, when we plead, come back to God. That we literally are called ambassadors for Christ. We are the mouthpiece for God. When I hear the word ambassador, I'm like a big uh, action movie fan. Anybody else in here? Action movie, okay. All right, I watch a lot of Little Mermaid, but I love a good action movie, okay? All right, love an action movie. Uh, when I think of ambassador, I always think of like the CIA, like secret agent, like some like diplomatic immunity, like some really fancy dude in like a suit and like a bulletproof car. That's what I think of when I hear the word ambassador, okay? But here's, here's what Paul, who wrote this letter to the church at Corinth, it was a city in, in the Roman Empire. Here's what the word picture that Paul is painting through his words that the people in this church, at, in this city of Corinth would have understood when they read the word ambassador. Because Corinth was a, a city in the empire of Rome. It was a part of the Roman empire that had been conquered, okay, and was now under the rule and reign of the Roman empire. There were two different types of like the words province. There's two different types of provinces in the Roman Empire. If you're a history nerd like I am, I love this kind of stuff, okay? So I won't camp out here for a long time if you don't like history, all right? But stick with me through this. So uh, so there's two different types of Roman provinces, okay? There was the senatorial province. Do you feel fancy because you know that phrase now? Senatorial province. Those were the parts of the Roman Empire that were closer to the capital. Those are the parts that were ruled and reigned by the Senate, by a, a governing body of people, then there were places outside or farther away from the Roman capital that were called imperial provinces, okay? Also sounds very like, I don't know, Mulan comes to mind, okay? Imperial provinces. And imperial provinces, they were ruled and reigned by an ambassador. Both, both provinces were ruled and reigned by the emperor. One was then had the, the, the middleman of the Senate and the other had the middleman of an ambassador. And so the people in the city of Corinth that's reading this letter that Paul wrote to them, when they read the word ambassador, they're immediately having the, the picture of the dude who is the ambassador of their city come to mind. Because you see, an ambassador was someone who would come into a city with the authority and power of the emperor. He would help establish reign and rule, and he would also be the one to listen to the people and take their thoughts, their problems, their struggles back to the emperor himself. He was like the middleman between the two. But what's so interesting about this time period is that like they didn't have social media or like the internet. So nobody could like Google each other and find out who each other are. Or anybody in here like a big stalker? You like meet somebody new and you're like, oh, I will find out your social security number in a heartbeat. Like, let's go. Okay. There was no like stalking of people. There's no way to find their Instagram. All right. So the ambassador, when he would show up into a new city, the way in which he would establish his authority in that place is, is that he would carry with him the image of the emperor. It would be a, a, a carving or um, a drawing of or a statue of the emperor's face that he would literally walk into the city carrying with him, displaying to the people in that city, I am coming into this place under the authority and by the power and as a representative of the emperor. So here when Paul says that you and I, if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, if we have been made new creations in Christ, that you and I are now ambassadors for Christ. We now bear with us the image of God. And when we walk into a place 
we do so under the authority and by the power of the one whose image we bear. Here Paul says that you and I are called ambassadors for Christ, or I like to say presence carriers. That when the moment that we trust Jesus to be our savior, it says that God's word says that we are indwelt. It's another big word. That we are now, we are indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives inside of us. Meaning the power and presence of God now dwells inside of me and you. So when we walk into a place, we walk into that place bearing the image and the power and the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So here Paul says that you and I are called to be ambassadors for Christ. We are called to be presence carriers. But what does that look like? How do we live that out? Well, I want us to look at a passage of scripture where I think we get to see this displayed maybe in the coolest of ways possible. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, uh, Acts is um, Acts is a book that was written talking about the acts of the apostles, right? Like the things that the apostles did, the beginning of the church, the way in which the guys who hung out with Jesus, who spent time with Jesus, the way in which they lived out their purpose as presence carriers. And so Acts, we, we get to read all about the beginning of the church, right? Like you and I, like the church, how that began, And all throughout Acts, we see these cool stories of these these followers of Jesus doing incredible things. Acts uh, starts after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. So Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose again from the grave three days later and ascended back, went back up into heaven where he is currently seated at the right hand of God. It's really cool. Go on and on about that. But before he left, he looked at his followers and he said, hey, I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for your life. I want you to go and make disciples, tell other people about me, help them know who I am and the forgiveness and the hope and the peace that I offer. And so Acts is all about how the followers of Jesus began to do the thing that they were created to do, the very thing that God called them to do. The beginning of Acts chapter 16, we actually read about um, the start of a church in a city called Philippi. If you've ever read the book of Philippians, this is where this comes from. And what I love about this, the beginning of this, is that it's Paul and Silas, these two followers of Jesus, who roll into this city of Philippi, and they meet a group of girls. Shout out to the ladies. (laughs) They meet a group of girls who want to know God, but don't know how to know God. And Paul and Silas, because they've heard the voice of God, they said, hey, we got to go talk to those, talk to that group of girls. So let's go talk to them about God. And these girls are like, we've been waiting for someone to come tell us about this. And this group of girls, God began to move and to work and started a church out of a small group of girls who were hanging out by a riverside. So if you ever want to know what, what girls can do, change the world. <laughs> Dude, the same thing's true for you too. But I love the beginning of Acts 16 because we see the beginning of a church. And then in the middle of Acts 16, you see Paul and Silas having started this church. They now get start to get followed around by this girl who has a demon possessing her. If you ever think the Bible's boring, you're wrong. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> this girl who has demon possessed starts following them around and mocking them and like being annoying. Okay, maybe some of you are like, that sounds like my little sister. All right, like, I don't know. But she just keeps following them around and they, they finally turn around and they're like, hey, get out of here. They cast the demon out of her. Epic. Cool. But the guy who owned that girl, he, he literally had her as a slave. Now all of a sudden, she all her cool powers went away. And so now he wasn't making the money he was making before. And he got mad and started spreading rumors about Paul and Silas and got them thrown into prison. And that's where we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 16 is Paul and Silas in a Roman prison. And let me, let me help you understand or get a better mental picture here. Roman prisons weren't like prisons today. They weren't like three meals and like time in the yard, okay? This was like literally a, a sewer system. So picture like, you know, those like holes in the ground, like the, the manholes, right? Like in the sewers, like down below. That's how you would enter into a Roman prison. It was like a, a, a scary dark dungeon, with, with prison cells that were usually not tall enough to stand up in, you, you were like seated and your, your feet were in like these things called stocks and your hands were in them too. And so you were just permanently in like a pike position. 
and you were stuck there, chained there. There was no bathrooms, there was no break times. And so Paul and Silas, for no fault of their own, actually really doing good things, are now shoved into this literal dark dungeon of a prison cell. And here's where we pick up the story in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. Paul and Silas, here in this Roman prison cell, in this dungeon, verse 25 says this, and around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. It's key that it says that the other prisoners were listening because they were not praying and singing hymns to God quietly to themselves. No, here in the darkness, I mean, imagine you can't see anything in, 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 with, with like rats. I mean, like think about just the worst of the worst. And here Paul and Silas are praying, singing hymns to God so loudly that the other prisoners were listening to them. Why could they do that? I think so often we read about guys in, in the Bible like this and we think like they must have been like super Christians. They like, I don't know, like Christian superpowers. That somehow they were like just better at life than we are. These are normal dudes. Picture like your dad, picture your brother, picture yourself. These are normal people. But the reason they could be locked in a Roman dungeon in the worst of the worst places with no hope of getting out, with no understanding of what God was going to do, the reason why they could sit there and pray and sing hymns of praise to God, the reason why they could do that is because Paul and Silas, they didn't go into that prison thinking, I'm a prisoner. They went into that prison knowing that their identity, that their purpose was to be a presence carrier of the person and work of Jesus into that prison. So often we get so wrapped up in our circumstances. We get so wrapped up in what's going on around us, the things that are outside of our control, that we forget who we are, what our purpose is. You see, Paul and Silas, they weren't worried about their reputation. They were worried about the, the one. They were focused on the one who established their reputation, their identity in the very first place. They weren't worried about their, their suffering ending. They were, they were focused on the one who had paid the ultimate price, who had suffered the ultimate cost on their behalf. They weren't worried about what tomorrow was going to look like because they were focused on the one who held their tomorrow in his hand. And out of the natural overflow of walking into that prison and being chained into that dungeon, knowing that their purpose there was to be a presence carrier of Jesus, the natural overflow of that was that they would sing praises to their God. That's incredible. That's a little mind-blowing when you think about it. But Paul and Silas understood the assignment. They understood the purpose that they were created for was to be a presence carrier of Jesus. And so if you and I are to live in the same way, if you and I are to learn to be presence carriers of Jesus, then what do we need to do? Well, I think what we can learn from this in their story is that we must be willing. We must be ready to say, God, I choose, I make a conscious decision. I choose to allow your presence in my life to, be, to, to not be my circumstances that determine this, but that your presence and not my circumstances would determine my perspective, my actions, and my words. God, that your presence and not my circumstances would be the thing that would determine my attitude, would, would determine the way in which I talk to my parents, would determine the way in which I, I apply myself at school, would determine the way in which I choose to make decisions of who I hang out with and who I date. God, I, I am determined. I am choosing. I'm making a conscious decision day after day, moment after moment to say, God, it is your presence and not my circumstances that will determine my perspective and my actions and my words. See, that's what Paul and Silas did sitting in that dungeon in the, in the most hopeless of places. They chose to allow God's presence in their lives, not their circumstances, 
to determine how they acted, what they said, what they did, and most of all, their perspective. We go on to read it in the next verses in Acts chapter 16, verse 26. It says this, And suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open, and he assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. I want us to pause here for a second because I want you to understand why the jailer would have responded in this way. I mean, let's put aside the fact that like some crazy earthquake just happened and everybody got free. Like that's wild, okay? But let's focus on the jailer for a minute, okay? That a Roman jailer, his one purpose in his job, the one purpose in his life was to keep the prisoners where the prisoners should be, <laughs> to get the prisoners to the punishment that they were going to be assigned. That was his one job. But the consequence of him failing at his job was that if he were to lose a prisoner, if that prisoner were to escape or something were to happen to that prisoner, that that jailer would have to take on the punishment of that prisoner. The jailer had such a, an important responsibility that if he were to lose a prisoner, he would have to take on the punishment that that prisoner deserved. So imagine with me that you were the, the, the jailer in this situation, and you wake up, right, it's midnight, it's middle of the night, you wake up and look at your jail, and every door is open, what are you thinking immediately? Everyone's gone. Who's going to stay in prison? And here this jailer, all he can sense, all he can see is hopelessness, because I'm sure guaranteed somebody in that jail was gonna be killed the next day. Guaranteed somebody in that jail was gonna have a pretty intense consequence. And so here this jailer says, it would be better for me to take my own life than to deal with whatever might come tomorrow as a consequence of me losing these prisoners. Can you imagine the hopelessness that this man must have felt? Truthfully, very likely, many of you have felt that kind of hopelessness at some point of your life. Many of you maybe right now, feel like you're in a season of just hopelessness. There is just no other choice. But I want you to see and understand what happens next in the story in Acts chapter 16, verse 28. This is what happens. It says this, Paul shouted to him, stop, do not kill yourself. We are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and ran into the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Remember, the prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas sing hymns and praise God, and so was the jailer. And here is the same voice who had just moments before been declaring the glory and goodness of God in the midst of hopelessness. And here is this jailer hearing again the voice of Paul saying, stop. It is not hopeless. We are still here. And here he runs and falls at their feet. And this is what he says to them. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. They said, sir, let me tell you the greatest news of tonight is not that we are still in our prison cells. The greatest news of tonight is that you, sir, you jailer, you authority figure, you can be saved tonight. Students, if you and I are going to be and live out the purpose for which God created us, the purpose for which he made us new creations in Christ Jesus. If you and I are going to be presence carriers, then we've got to start doing something very specific. And that is calling people out of hopelessness, out of darkness, and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know about um, some of you, but uh, I talk to a lot of students a lot who 
they'll say, um, Kate, I'm the counselor friend. I'm like the mom friend in my friend group. Like everybody brings me their issues. Anybody feel that way? Like you're like the one who everybody like comes, like brings their, yep, okay, I see some kindred spirits. I, everybody brings me their struggles and I like counsel them through it. It's like what my lunch table at school looks like is me just like bringing, you know, all the wisdom. And I'm like, hey, that's so great. And I love that God has given you the heart to love people and the heart to care for people. And I know sometimes I've been in the very same spot, but here's what I want to challenge you in tonight. It is very easy for us to start calling people out of darkness, out of depression, out of anxiety, out of loneliness, out of broken relationships, out of a really unhealthy dating situation. Anybody in here, you know, represent on that one? We try to call people out of those things and into our own wisdom. We try to call people out of darkness and into our own strength. We think, hey, I will be this person's savior. Hey, I will carry this load for you, friend. Just dump it all on me and I will handle it. But let me tell you where that takes you each and every time. That takes you into darkness. That you are stepping into a position that you were never created to be able to handle. You were never created to be able to bear. See, God doesn't call us to call people out of darkness and into our strength. He calls us to call people out of darkness and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. A few years ago, my, my best friend in the whole world, she's like the most bubbly. She's like captain of the cheerleading squad, like homecoming queen, all the things. Very annoying, okay? But she's very great. A couple of years ago, she, she was diagnosed with, with severe depression, which was like out of left field for who she was. And for, for several months, she tried every medication and counseling and procedure and and thing that doctors could come up with. She went to specialists. She went everywhere, tried everything. And one night she texted me and just said, Kate, I just left the doctor. And, and they said they've done literally everything they can think of. And they just told me that, honestly, there is no hope for this ever being healed. That I'm just, if I'm going to survive, I just have to learn how to live with this depression. She said, Kate, I just don't think I can do it. And I sat there reading that text message at my house, and I have probably never felt more hopeless and helpless. And me being like the person that I am, I wanted to write this beautiful text message of like love. And I wanted to get on a plane and fly to her. I was like, what do I will punch people in the face? Like, what do I need to do? Like, I will solve this problem for her. So I write out probably like 20 different text messages, and I'm talking like books, okay? I write out all these words and all this stuff, and every time I would get to the end, I would feel like this is, no, this, is, this isn't it. This is insufficient. This, this doesn't solve the problem, and I would delete it and start again. And eventually, I just surrendered to the fact that there was nothing I could say that could solve her brokenness, that could heal this depression in here. There was, there was no wisdom that I had. There were no quippy statements that I could come up with. There was no hope that I could cast that would bring hope into her life. Instead, in God's graciousness and his gentleness, he reminded me that his word, that his truth, that a relationship with him is in fact the only thing that can bring healing and hope. And and so I began to Google every verse about hope I could think of (laughs) and every verse about the goodness of God that I could find. And I began to type those out and copy and paste them into a text message. I sent it to her husband and I said, hey, I don't actually think she's strong enough to read these. I need you to read these over her. I just need you to declare the truth of who God is and what his plan is and the hope he has for her over her tonight. And the next morning I woke up to a text message from my best friend saying, Kate, Coley's her husband's name. She said, Kate, Coley read those scriptures over me last night as I laid in bed. And I was able to sleep for the first time in so long. And Kate, it was like the presence of God began to fill my heart with his peace, like I have not felt in so long. And she said, thank you for reminding me of the truth of who God is. I have hope. And students, let me tell you, that is not because I came up with some fancy thing to say. That was because I called my friend out of darkness and back into a relationship, back into the understanding of who God is and who he calls her in him. That you and I, if we are to be presence carriers, we are to call people not out of darkness and into our own strength, but out of darkness and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We go on to read this in Acts chapter 28. 
28, or I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, the jailer is asked, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas respond and they say this, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It is as simple and as straightforward as that. He goes on in verse 32 to say this, and they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. So literally this jailer was like, this is good stuff. Come with me to my house. Can you imagine if Paul and Silas, if I were Paul and Silas, I'd be like, hey, it's been real. It's been fun. Loved this. This has been a journey. Uh, we're going to go not be here with the jailer who was, you know, going to like punish us. Okay. We'd like to go anywhere else. But no, Paul and Silas said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want us to come to your house and talk to, talk to your family about Jesus? Done. Got it. We, we're there. So the jailer takes them to his house and they share the word of God, the truth of who Jesus is with everyone in his household. In verse 33, even at that hour of the night, middle of the night, even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then, and, and then he and everyone in his house were baptized, meaning that he and everyone in his house put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and took the very first step in their walk with Jesus to be baptized in the middle of the night. Of all places, the jailer's house. You see, Paul and Silas didn't go into that prison believing that their identity was a prisoner. They went into that prison believing and knowing that their identity, that their purpose was to be a presence carrier of Jesus Christ. And if you and I are to do the same thing, then we've got to be willing to not only say, God, I, I declare that your presence, not my circumstances, will determine my, my perspective and my actions and my words. And God, not only will I call people out of darkness and into a relationship with you, but we must be willing to say, God, I will go wherever you call me to go. I will, I will speak to whoever you put in front of me. And God, I will leave the rest up to you. You see, Paul and Silas were willing to not only go into that prison, but they were willing to go into the jailer's house and speak to his family and tell them about the good news of who Jesus is. And they trusted God to do the rest, and in God's goodness and his grace, the, this man's whole family came to know Christ. Students, if you and I are gonna be presence carriers of Jesus, then we must be willing to say, God, I will go wherever you want me to go, back into the hallways of my school in a few weeks, back into the kitchen of my home tonight, God, back into the group chat of my friend group, God, back into the locker room of my team. I'm willing to go wherever it is you call me to go to speak the truth of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, what he did for us, and how we can respond to anyone and everyone that you put in front of me. And God, I will trust you to do the rest. Students, that is what being a presence carrier of Jesus looks like. But many of you may have heard this story about Paul and Silas and might, might sound really cool and like, wow, I wish I had the kind of strength to be in the worst of the worst spots. I wish I had, had the, the, the grace to be able to be in such an awful situation and, and deal with it in a, in a good way. Maybe this all sounds really fun and nice and good and happy to you, but you don't understand what it means to genuinely be a presence carrier of Jesus because you don't have the presence of Jesus in your life. That you've been playing the church game. You, you go to church, you, uh, you know all the right answers. Maybe for you, you've been living a pretty decent life. You could list out the good things you do. Maybe for you, you're just like, hey, I just don't even know anything about this God. But here's what I want you to know is if you have never made the decision to trust Jesus as your Lord and as your savior, then you can't be a presence carrier of Christ because you don't have the presence of Christ in your life. But we have a God who desires nothing more than to make you new. We have a God who desires nothing more than to be present with you in your struggle, to be present with you in your joy. We have a God who desires that you would know him and walk with him. So tonight, would you do something for me? Would you just bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? you lay aside whatever distraction might be rolling through your brain or in your hands let me ask you genuinely this question 
do you have the presence of Jesus in your life? Have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? I like to think of it like this. If you, if you picture in your mind a, a wedding, maybe you've been to one, maybe you've seen one on TV. But there's a moment when the, when the bride is walking down the aisle and everybody looks at her and you know, is taking pictures. It's this beautiful moment. But in that moment, while she's walking down the aisle, that girl, she is a bride, but she is not yet a wife. It's not until she stands at the altar and says, declares with her mouth, I choose to enter into a relationship with you, that her identity changes, that her relationship to that man changes. You see, students, when we make the decision to surrender our lives to Jesus, it is in a moment, there is a time, there is a decision that we make. It is an altar moment before God that we say, I choose to enter into a relationship with you, Jesus. Paul and Silas said to the jailer, it is, simple, it is as simple as believing in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. In that moment, your identity changes, your relationship to God changes, everything in fact changes because you were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. And if you have never had that altar moment, if you have never made that decision before, let me invite you that tonight can be the night that you lay aside the sin of your past and you step into a relationship with the God who loved you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. But the beauty is that he didn't stay dead, but he rose from the grave, defeating shame and guilt and fear and anxiety and depression and the sin that has held you captive for so long. He defeated in his resurrection and suit it tonight. You can step into the freedom that he brought you. So if that's you tonight and you wanna make that altered decision, you want to make that the most life-changing, eternity-changing decision to surrender your life to Christ. Let me tell you, it's as simple as what Paul and Silas told the jailer. Believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I'm going to pray a prayer. You can pray this prayer phrase by phrase with me. There's nothing magical about the words in this prayer. It is all about your heart you putting your faith in Jesus. But if you are ready to make that decision, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. There is nothing I can do to earn your forgiveness. Jesus, I trust that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead in the best way I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I trust you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Student tonight, if you made that decision, if you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time and you meant it with your whole heart, genuinely surrendering your heart and life to Jesus Christ, just like the jailer did that night with Paul and Silas. I would love to pray over you. I would love to rejoice and celebrate with you. And so if you made that decision tonight, would you just look up at me? I would love the chance to just make eye contact with you. Cool. Did you make that decision tonight for the very first time? Do you mean it with your whole heart? That's incredible. That's the coolest thing you could ever do. Hey, these girls right here, did you, did you guys make that decision tonight with your whole heart? Did you genuinely surrender your life to Jesus? That is incredible. I am so proud of you. There's no greater decision you could make. Girls right back here, is that you? Did you make that decision tonight? Do you trust Jesus with your whole heart? That's incredible. Gentlemen right here, is that you? Man, that is the greatest decision you could ever make. I am so proud of you. Your eternity looks different. If that was you tonight, ladies back here, do I see you guys? Is that you? Did you make that decision tonight for the very first time? That is incredible. I am so proud of you. Your eternity looks different because of this. You are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. Incredible. 
Students tonight, if you looked up at me, if I, if I caught your eye, or maybe if I didn't because the lights are kind of bright, here, here's what I would love. I would love the chance to help you know what it looks like to begin to walk in a relationship with Jesus. You, you've had that altar moment where you have you've surrendered your life to Christ, you have been made new, but now you gotta learn how to use the fork. You gotta learn how to live and walk in this relationship with Jesus. And I wanna help you do that. And our leaders here wanna help you do that. And so I, I'm gonna count to three just to give you a time to go. But here's what I'm gonna ask is that you would, you would stand up and you would walk to the back. And we've got some leaders back here who would love to help you learn what it looks like to use the fork, to learn what it looks like to walk with Jesus, who wanna pray for you and with you. So I'm going to count to three. You can grab a friend if you want to take your friend with you. That's no worries. You won't miss out on anything. This is the most important thing you could do. So if you made that decision tonight with for the very first time and you genuinely meant it with your whole heart, on the count of three, I want you to stand up and walk to the back. That's it. So here we go. Three, two, one. Go for it. If that was you, I want you to head to the back. I want you to find a leader. Yeah, we can celebrate with them. incredible. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, for those of you who are still in the room, I want to ask for just one, two more minutes of your attention. If you're still here in this room, I, I'm going to make an assumption. It's a little scary to make an assumption at any time, but I'm going to make an assumption that, that you have a relationship with Jesus. So whether it was last night or last week or last year or 10 years ago, you had that altar moment with Christ that you surrendered your life to Jesus. That in that moment, you were made a new creation like Ariel got legs, you were made new in Christ. But maybe you're still struggling to know how to walk in this relationship. Maybe you have been living like a prisoner even though you have been set free. Tonight, I, I wanna encourage you I wanna challenge you that coming out of youth conference, that stepping back into your homes, that stepping back on, onto your, your teams as you begin practice for school, as you get ready to walk back into the hallways of your school that maybe was hard, that you are going back into those places that everywhere, in fact, that you walk into, you are walking into as a presence carrier of Jesus Christ that your identity is no longer a soccer player or a 10th grader, that your identity is as a presence carrier, a son or a daughter of the most high God. And where you go, you carry the presence of God with you. And so would you do that boldly? Would you be willing to say, God, I choose. I make a conscious decision to allow your presence in my life to determine my perspective my words and my actions. God, I choose that I will call people who are in darkness out of darkness and into a relationship with you. God, I choose, I declare that I will go wherever it is you call me to go. I will speak to whoever it is you call me to speak to. And God, I will trust you to do the rest. So here's my challenge for you tonight. What of those is the hardest? What of those is the most intimidating? Is it allowing God's presence in your life to determine your perspective? Are you really good at letting your circumstances determine your perspective and your words and your actions? Are you really nervous about the idea of calling someone out of darkness and into a relationship with Jesus? Is it really nerve wracking for you to, to go, to, to say, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Do you like your comfort zone a lot? Do you get nervous talking to people? What is it that's the hardest for you? Just a minute, I, I'm gonna pray. We're gonna get the chance to worship some more. But I wanna ask you to take just a second to confess that thing before the Lord. God, I, I get nervous talking to people. God, I, I don't wanna go back to my old school again. God, God I, I, I recognize that I call people out of darkness and into my own strength. God, I recognize that I let my circumstances control me far too often. Confession just means to agree with God. Would you take a second and would you confess the thing that is the hardest for you? Would you confess that to the Lord? God, this is hard. God, this is difficult. God, it's scary. 
God, I, I feel like I'm in that dungeon. I feel like I understand what Paul and Silas felt like. But God, I'm tired of living my life like a prisoner. Instead, I wanna live in the presence and the power and the purpose that you have created me for. God, I wanna start living as a presence carrier of you. God, I pray over these students and these leaders. Lord, I, I ask that by your power and for your glory, God, they would step out of the thing that ha has held them captive, that has kept them quiet, that has had them feel like they are prisoners in their lives. God, I pray that they would step out of those things and begin to walk in the purpose and the calling that you have created them for. Oh God, would, would they understand their purpose and their calling to be presence carriers of yours? God, as they walk back into their schools in a few weeks, God, as they walk back into their homes tonight, God, as they enter back into group chats with their friends, God, as they, as they begin to talk with other people and meet new people, God, would they understand that they are being sent into this world as presence carriers of Jesus Christ, as ambassadors the mouthpiece through which you are calling the lost into a relationship with you. Oh God, would they live in that purpose? God, would that be true of these students? Would that be true of these leaders? God, would that be true of me? I thank you, Father, that you loved us enough to send your son to give us the chance to be forgiven and free. Oh Lord, would we walk in our purpose as presence carriers? Jesus, it's in your powerful and your good and your life-changing name we pray. Amen and amen.